So here's another integrated Y. It deals with, how do you want to call it? Your employment by God. God deploys each of us. And since we're so stupid and human, we are constantly comparing ourselves by ourselves, which like Paul wrote, that's not wise. Instead, what we need to be comparing is God's choice. Okay? there's no, The whole self-worth thing is just completely irrelevant. It truly is. Here's what's relevant. God had the choice of making you or not. He made you. You wouldn't exist if he didn't put your soul in the bo- in the fetus exiting what ended up being your mother's womb at birth. He chose to do that. You would not be a you if he didn't create your soul at birth. That's the whole point of the Bible when it's talking about birth and womb verses. And you know what? Christians are so insecure and they hate God's word so much they don't even bother to read it to know that when God talks about abortion which I made just made some videos on it you know Exodus 21 22 the fetus is not a legal person which means that if a fetus aborts in the example it was the woman is in the middle of a fight and one guy hits her and that causes her to abort it's called miscarriage but abortion is is really what the same thing is to miscarry all right and the Latin word that I showed in the Bible, in the Vulgate, is abortivum. Okay, that's where we get the word abortion in English. Because it basically comes from the word to miscarry. Well, miscarriage is the fetus falls out. That's the way the Hebrew puts it. And that's pretty much the way the, the Greek put it, too. It falls out. Yeah, it falls out because it's a miscarriage. That's not a legal person. Okay? God could have still said, Oh, I'm. I, it falls out. I'm going to impute a soul. Once it falls out. And we even have some current, you know, YouTube videos on children who really shouldn't be alive. But when they came out of the womb, God imputed a soul to them because they are alive. In one, in one of the kids' cases, it's really heartbreaking. The kid just has a brain stem, but no brain. And he's now, what, two years old or something. And in another case, the kid had part of a brain. God imputed the soul. It's clearly the soul that makes the baby a baby. Because in one case, there's no brain. brain. There's just a brain stem. And the soul being immaterial, well, God knows how to make it work, and he's clearly making it work. So that baby will probably die soon, but will be in heaven because it has a soul. It's obviously never going to be able to choose to believe in Christ, but God chose to give it a soul. God's choice. Now, why did God do that? Obviously, for the sake of the parents. Now look at that. That's an employment example. God put, God chose, God elected to put a soul in that baby that had no brain. Just a brain stem. Which means that God is using the soul in connection with the brain stem so that it's actually a baby. Alive. In this case for two years. That baby has no brain, so it has no comprehension. Certain amount of reflex motility. All right. It still has a soul. Now, why would God do that? For the sake of the parents, he's employing the baby. The baby doesn't know that. The baby can't know anything. It has no brain. Okay? It's totally amazing, the scientists, and to me too, for that matter. 
Okay, it has other applications at the other end of your life. When you're in a coma, or when you can't talk, or when you seem to be paralyzed. What's going on there? Or when your brain is so damaged, what's going on there? And yet the person is still technically alive. So it applies at both ends, at the beginning of life and the end of life. What's the story there? Why does God do what God does? Why did God let this happen to me? Why did God let this happen to us? I'll be, re you know, um, I'm not sure when I'm going to post this increment of it, but in the integrated whys, you know, I, I will or have, by the time you hear this, I will or have, started talking about the whole why me question because that's one of the whys it's one of the biggest whys you, you'll, fi you'll find that you face is why is this happening to me why did God employ a baby with no brain and he obviously employed it because it's got a soul and no brain so there's no chance that the child is ever going to be able to understand the gospel so he's going straight to heaven when he dies and he's probably not going to live very long Obviously, he's employing the child and the parents together. He's using something in the child to teach the parents and something in the parents. Well, the child can't learn anything. But that soul still has an employment. Now, so does yours. And we're all busy, as I started to say, we're all busy comparing each other to each other, and that's not wise. What we should compare to is God's choice, God's reasoning, God's enjoyment. God's choice was that you exist as you are. And you look at your life, and there's things about your life compared to other people that you feel as, uh, how do you want to call it, resentment, resentful or shameful or terrible or bad or wrong. And we're all tempted to blame somebody else or ourselves for the situation we got. Because we're constantly comparing the situation we're in to something else or someone else. And we're always prone to say that something else or someone else is better or worse than me. That's not how God thinks doesn't make it irrelevant exactly but it's not it's not the right perspective when I say right I'm not talking about moral right it's not it's not the truth here's the truth God made you he wanted your existence there doesn't need to be any more justification than that it doesn't matter how you compare to anybody else. What matters is that God wanted you to exist. You could be the worst person in town or the best person in town. It doesn't matter. God wanted you to exist. The justification for your existence was an issue to God. And here you are. It was also an issue to Christ when he was on the cross. It was up to him whether he wanted to pay for you or not. He did. Okay, so... The people who matter the most, I'm using the term people loosely, the persons who matter the most, and actually the Holy Spirit too, because if the Holy Spirit didn't want to sustain Christ paying for your sins, then he wouldn't have done that, and you wouldn't have got paid for, and you wouldn't have gotten born. So God the Father, God the Son, and his humanity too, and God the Holy Spirit, he said, I do. To you before you were even born knowing full well everything you'd be and having total power and still of course having total power to change whatever it is that you are so are you rich then they wanted that are you poor then they wanted that are you healthy then they want that are you sick? Then they want that. And it doesn't freaking matter if anybody else wants it. It doesn't matter what you think about it. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about it. Technically speaking, whatever it is that you got, 
they want you to have. And that doesn't necessarily mean anything good or bad about you. See, let's go back to the parents and the kid. The kid has no brain. He's born with just a brain stem. Born that way. You cannot say the kid deserved to be born like that. It's not possible. For all I know, that kid cannot sin. That's an interesting, you know, set of metaphysical things you can get into. The kid has no volition if he has no brain. How could his soul and only to, to, to have a, a functioning volition? He has no brain. A soul has a volition, but what? how can the volition work? Okay? How is he going to be able to sin? See, in order to sin, you have to have volition that integrates. Integrates. See, that's the theme of this episode, right? You have to have a soul that integrates with your brain. Because it's your brain that tells your body what to do. How's his soul going to integrate with his brain when he has no brain? So then, where's his sin? How can he sin? So you can't say that that baby with obviously a soul, but no brain, where's the sin? And therefore, you can't say that he deserved to be born that way, but God chose him to be born that way. Now that's an example of somebody innocent. Okay. Are you going to then blame his parents? You can't do that. Why? How could the parents... How, what, what possible sin could the parents commit that would warrant the baby being born that way? This is how stupid people are. You know, they assume that if you had a miscarriage or an abortion, that you're a bad person. Or they assume that if you have a child that's born sick, that you're a bad person. That if anything bad happens to you, it's because you're bad. Who says that? Christ went to the cross. Christ died on the cross. There was nothing wrong with him. we got to get rid of this attitude that, oh, bad stuff happens, therefore I'm bad. That you're a good person if you're rich, or you're a good person if you're, you know, have a successful life by somebody's standards. Says who? Satan's the most beautiful creature ever to come from the hand of God. That's in what? Isaiah 14? Ezekiel 28? He's still that beautiful. He didn't become ugly. God made him beautiful. He's still beautiful. So, you know, talk about success and beauty and everything you'd ever want as a human being. He's got it in spades. So does that make him a good person? That's ridiculous. Now, think of the wider picture. The parents, therefore, cannot possibly, no matter what they did right or wrong, cannot possibly have deserved that child. So then maybe it's not about deserving. Maybe when something good happens to you, it's about something else. When something bad happens to you, it's about something else. What is the employment role? What is the deployment role? And we all know the answer to that question if we thought about it. Training. Christ is perfect. He never sinned. So then why do you have such a bad end? This is what the atheist says. In fact, this is what the Quran is founded on. The Quran maintains that Jesus was a good person and therefore didn't really die on the cross. And there's, you know, a whole bunch of, I don't know what... Um, subdivision of Islam you call them but there are a whole bunch of Muslims who 
highly, highly revere Jesus as a man, as a prophet. And there's one at least, and I don't know what his Muslim sect is, guy whose pen name is Harun Yahya. He's a Turkish guy. Okay? He's, he writes books about the second coming of Christ. See, a lot of Muslims believe in the second coming of Christ. But what they maintain, because Jesus was good, he didn't die. That he was just taken up immediately to heaven. And then they manufacture the myth that that same thing happened to um, Muhammad. But it happened first to Jesus. And they maintain that Muhammad got on this donkey and magically traveled from Medina to Jerusalem and died and, and was raised on the very rock that was the Holy of Holies. It's really kind of goofball. And his last speech, supposedly to his people before this happened, was to go up to Jerusalem and kill all the Jews. The kill all the Jews part is left out of the English translations. You only hear that if you're learning it in the original Arabic. <laughs> or maybe the Othman edited Arabic. Anyhow, the point is, is that the Quran believes that because Jesus was good, he did not die on the cross. And it says that. I want to say it's in... Oh boy, I'm just saying this off the top of my head. You have to look it up. Um, Surah 4... Um, Ayat meaning verse 157. But you can just go to Quran.com, Q U R A N.com, and search on Jesus and you'll find it. I want to say it's in the Miriam Surah, but that's not, Miriam Surah is number 19. So I don't know what, I don't remember the name of the fourth one, but I think it's 4.157. Alright, it says that Jesus didn't die on the cross. That's why they say it. He's good, therefore he didn't die on the cross. That God just took him up. And of course he's only a man, because the Quran also thinks that somehow, you know, if, if, if Christ is also God, therefore God has partners. But then they're also, you know, Islam is a complete, complete joke. It's a real, really a terrorist manifesto. But the, the Muslims don't know because they don't know their Bible, their Quran any better than Christians know their Bible. And what am I trying to get at here? God employs and God deploys. Now, most of us have had at least enough exposure to history to notice that, oh, there was a sequence of events that when this happened, then this happened, then the next thing, and the next thing, and if all of those events didn't occur the way they did, then like World War One wouldn't have happened, World War Two wouldn't have happened, we wouldn't have the, you know, the, the light bulb. There are a bunch of events in different places sometimes around the world that have to occur in a certain sequence or did occur in a certain sequence and the result was something of extreme significance to history or mankind. You know, discovery of diseases, discovery of, you know, uh, vaccines. Everything that, if you, if you look at the long sweep of history, you'll notice that there are causal connections. And one of the guys who did a really good series on this was a guy named James Burke, B-U-R-K-E. His series was called The Day the Universe Changed, if I recall correctly. It was a PBS series 20, 30 years ago. You can still buy it, you know, at pbs.org. And that's what he was trying to do, is trace... The connections. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. And then the next thing you know, we got, you know, the wheel, or fire, or whatever, the plow. I think he did one of his series was on the plow. Okay? How do we get our modern plows? It's fascinating to study how a thing goes from... You know, like Middle East, middle, you you got the 300s A.D., 
All right, Rome is in her last legs. By the end of the 400s AD, there pretty much is no Rome. There is a, a sort of fake version of it in what was called Byzantium. Okay, they called it New Rome. We called it Byzantium. Um, there was a fake version of Rome, but pretty much Rome had died out with Odovacar around 476 AD. And it's fascinating to trace the rise of the modern nation state from that point. Okay? But you can causally trace it. This event happened, and this event happened, and this event happened. And if you take out any one of those events, then what we call modern life today wouldn't exist. Okay? But you only see that with hindsight. You don't see it at the time. Okay, so here you are living today, and you have no idea what God is doing with your life. You don't have any idea what he's doing with anybody else's life. And the really sad thing is your your mouthy Christians. You know, the ones who are on TBN and all that stuff. The ones who thump their Bibles. Okay? They think they're doing great things for God. And they're doing nothing. But actually causing trouble. Okay, so here you are, dumb bunny Christian. All you know is you got to use one John one nine and study on your teacher and learn and live on the Bible what that your teacher's teaching. Male teacher, never female. If you're using my audios or videos as a substitute for getting under a male teacher, stop listening to me right now. This is so that you can play with the stuff you're already studying under your teacher. All my stuff is meant for brainstorming. Now that's a link in a chain. That's how God's employing me. I know how he's employing me. But I don't know how he's employing me with you. See the difference? On a daily basis, I don't know how he's employing me. I know this here now. But I don't know who he's going to give it to. I don't know who's going to find this audio. Now, why is it that way? So much of what you do during a day, you have no clue that he's even using you. Okay? You know the spiritual life is 1 John 1 9. Study on your right male teacher. Learn and live on Bible all day long. Talk to God as much as possible. In your head, of course, if somebody's around. And that's all you know. You have no idea how God's using it. You have no idea what he's doing with it. And on the occasions where you you know you're supposed to talk to other believers, you don't really know what he's doing. You think you know, because you're talking. That part you know. I'm talking right now. But you don't know what he does with it. What's the story here? Well, think about this. If you did know all the story. Okay? Then whose work is it? If you don't know what he's doing with it, then it can't be your work, can it? So whose work is it? His. And the beauty of this, above all, and this gets back to the thing I was saying earlier, The beauty of it above all is that you wouldn't want it to be your work. You want it to be his. Well, if it's his, it's got to be blind. You know, God's a spirit. God's not human. You can't see God. So you can't see his work either. If you can't see it, then you can't influence it. If you can't see it, then you can't twist it. If you can't see it, then you can't cause it. And guess what? The person who receives his work through you, then they know it didn't come from you either. Isn't that beautiful? 
That's how I get the courage to talk in these audios or post the videos and show the Bible and all the other stuff. This is where I get the courage to be so bold and sometimes nasty. Because ain't nothing I'm doing ever works. It only works if he does it. And I don't know when he does it. I don't know to whom he's doing it. People call me and tell me. People write me and tell me. Oh, bring it out. I remember you said something 20 years ago. And I'm all, what? I said, I don't remember what I say. Well, obviously, I didn't do it. God did it. I've had people, I've had people write me from all over the world. Oh, bring out this. Oh, bring out that. Doesn't happen often, but it happens. Oh, you said this. And I did that with it. And blah, blah, blah. And of course, they want to be nice to me. They're feeling very enthusiastic. They want to accredit me. And and I'm always dumbfounded because obviously they got it from God, not me. God just picked up a little snippet of something I said and stuck it in them. He did that. And what he's doing is deploying them with their story to me to show me that he deployed me there. Now, you don't think I'm the only one on earth that he's doing that with, do you? See, this is what I'm trying to get at. Why did God create a child with no brain? And why does God create a brain now? He knows what he's going to do with the brain now. Just like he knows what he's doing with the child with no brain. I don't know. The child with no brain doesn't know. When I'm dead, I'll know. When the child with no brain is dead, that child will know. Now, obviously, that child will have, you know, full adult appreciation of things so it doesn't matter that he never had it down here he'll have it forever up there because he can't not be saved he doesn't have a brain to say no to God there's no way he can ever understand the gospel so he'll be in heaven forever his parents are like deployed to him they will be his parents when he's in heaven too. And they'll be thrilled to death to see what God did for him. And God's doing something for the parents using him. So it doesn't matter that he never has a brain. Okay? And for a brain out, and for you, isn't it the same story? I don't know what God's doing with what I'm saying. I only know that occasionally I get reports. You don't know what God's doing with what you're saying? But you will get reports. You might not get them while you're down here. You might not get them for a while. You might get them in the next five minutes. But that's the point of this. God deploys each one of us. In my case, I don't know, a librarian, witness... I show the Bible on screen and I show what it says. And then the reader is able to play with that based on what he's already learning under his own teacher. Because I have to study that stuff. So instead of just studying it and not publishing it, I publish it because it's too important to just keep to myself. And making money on it is wrong. So I can't publish it and make money on it. At least I think it's wrong. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but right now that's what it looks like. So I, I just publish what I find. I found it. If you found a weed in your backyard and you say, I found a weed, should you get credit for that? No. If you pulled the weed you found, should you get credit for that? No. So if I find something in Bible, should I get credit for that? No. But it really is there, and it really is displayed, and it's the Bible, so it's important. So I'm deployed, aren't I? You were deployed to find the weed in your yard. 
Now, what if you found the weed in the White House yard? So somebody publishes you. Okay, God deployed you to do that. And you say, well, that's not important. How do you know? It was important enough to God to choose you to be born. It was important enough to God to cause you to find that weed, whether it was in your yard or the White House yard. Who cares? You see the point? God sees every moment you breathe. God chose your existence. He saw every moment you would breathe. It was a choice to God. At that moment when the fetus exited the womb, do I put a soul inside this exiting body or not? Knowing full well all of the causes, conditions, successions, and relations that would occur if he chose to do that. And he chose to do that. Nobody forced him. It was his sovereign choice that you exist. So every moment you breathe, God wanted that. So does it matter whether you're pulling weed in the yard or discovering the secret of nuclear physics? No. God chose you. That's the only important thing about your life. That's the only importance you need to have. God likes your existence. God loves you. He chose your existence. He underwrites every moment you breathe. Do you need any more vindication than that? So now, how is God deploying you? How does God want to use the next 60 seconds you're breathing? Find out. Because, honey, you don't need any more justification. He gave it to you the minute he birthed you, the minute he saved you, which he actually did in eternity past, and then played it out now. So how does he want the next 60 seconds of your life to play? Ask him. 